We might be on here, are we? Let's see, we're waiting. All right, my friends, I think, are we on? It sounds like uh, the technologies are with us at the moment. So, uh, hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, it is, uh, for you who got this notification that we're doing this live, well, you probably know who we are, but we'll introduce ourselves anyway. So, I'm Oscar. I'm this Fred. Fred. Hello. So, uh, we are, uh, we run the Herman Weimer Vineyard and, and Standing Stone here together. So, um, uh, although we wish you're over here with us, you're not, so we are trying to figure out other ways to to uh, reach out to you and connect, so we thought we should try try a little live live here. So, um, last uh, year this time, we would have probably prepared the tasting room for, for about 100 people here to come in, but now it's our studio, so here we are. Um, so, again, in the spirit of what the hell do we do now when no one's visiting? <laughs> Let's try this out. Um, so, um, a little general update, because we have seen a lot of questions are coming in, and we got emails from people, and we, we love hearing from everybody. So, uh, again, a lot of people are asking, how are the ladies in the tasting room? How's the team? What are we doing? And overall, we're doing well, aren't we, Fred? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> the ladies, Cheryl, Wanda, uh, Dottie and the gang, they're home, being safe, and here at the winery we're trying to plug along. As many of you know, being spring, uh, the vines are growing, we're pruning, the nursery's going. Got pretty busy here in the last couple of days. Yeah, the, the vineyard work uh, hasn't, hasn't quarantined, um, and um, you know, it's, it's, it is springtime. <clears throat> we were, a, a month ago, um, we were expecting an early bud break, and if anyone, anybody living in the northeast here has felt the last couple of weeks, uh, it really cooled down, and um, we actually had three inches of snow blanketing the vineyards on Sunday morning, which yeah. was a shock to the system, but, um, but vineyard work continues, and we should be tied by the, all the vineyards should be tied by the end of this weekend, and... As Oscar mentioned, we're grafting for next year vines and um, shipping this year vines still. So mm -hmm. that's all. We were a little concerned there for a while process. because the winter, as for you who live in the Northeast, was as it was very mild. Mm -hmm. So in March we thought we we're going to have early budding. Yeah. And then, so as you who live here knows that that could damage our gardens and our vines when the frost mm -hmm. comes in early. But then we got this cool area, so I think we're. I don't say we're safe. If I say we're safe, I screw it up. That's right. You will. But, so I won't yeah. say that we're safe. No, don't though. say. No, but, but we, we, have, looking, we, have three, we have three cherry trees at the top end of the driveway here um, that are really our indicator of where we are in the season, and, and we use that as the benchmark from year to year. Um, and they were in f um, basically full bud break about two and a half weeks ago, um, mm -hmm. and you could start seeing bees getting ready to, you know, in, in, in anticipation of, of pollinating, and that has been basically put on hold. Yeah, put on, yeah. So, I we'll don't know. I even got reports from what happened in Washington. You know, they had a cherry, mm -hmm. cherry tree blossom. That was it, it was it was fast. It was okay? it was in February. They usually pour uh, it very March. often. The f how it looks in our vineyard. So, all right, shall we? Um, uh, so, what we have here, Fred and I are here, but also behind the camera, we have. Part of our management team here, we have Teresa and Jen sitting reading all the questions. So they will, will uh, uh, feed us with information should you have any questions there. But I think we should be starting drinking. Mm. That would be devastating Absolutely. if we don't do that. Uh, Fred and I, we started here already uh, with the Blanc de Blanc for 09, but that was just for us to get us going. Uh, but we thought well, today... Yeah, can, we, can we actually can we talk about it? We should talk about this <laughs> a little bit about this. I mean, okay. can't skip over this. Uh, it's 09 Blanc de Blanc. Um, it's our 10-year release of this uh, cuvee. It's our second wine to be released uh, after a 10-year um, aging period within the cellar. Um, so Dylan and Brianna and team, we discord in January, and it's been released, um, and I 
think at the moment we're the only ones drinking it because um, I don't know if it's technically released. Is it technically? Okay, it is. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Don't listen to me. Listen to Jenny and Teresa. Um, but it's a uh, it's really classic classic sparkling. So anyway, oh nine Blanc de Blanc. For, so so for you who know as well, you know that we make uh, sparkling wine. Uh, for you who might not uh, be aware of it, obviously Riesling is a big focus of ours, and that's what our a lot of our time and our emotional energy goes to Riesling, but over the last 15-20 years you will see us going into pretty heavy into sparkling wines, also Cabernet Franc. Mm -hmm. uh, always been flirting with Gewurz Traminer too, mm -hmm. and Pinot Noir, but definitely Cab Franc and sparkling has been a, what we do. Mm -hmm. All right, shall I, I poured the dry Riesling for you. This glass? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, welcome. Um, I thought, we thought we'll we, I know we said that we're going to do new releases, I believe. Is that what we said? Yes, yeah. New release. A new release. However, this is not a new release. But it's, it's so important that we taste these wines, so we thought we should try them. So we start off with a dry Riesling and the dry reserve, um, mainly because I think this, the, f the, the thought process and the techniques that we're using when we make our Riesling kind of reflects the rest of the wines that we do. So it's kind of important. And also, this is the wine, the dry Riesling is what you be able to buy in the local retail store or in New York City, or this we distributed to 30 states now and abroad. I don't know if there's any Swedes hanging on Facebook, but score uh, it. This, you might even find this uh, uh, Rostov Waters too in Europe. So the, the dry Riesling uh, is kind of our Flagship. Is that a good word for it? It's a great word. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so flagship, this is again the focus. This We source this, the fruit that comes from all our vineyards. We have we have vineyards around Anska Lake. About, we manage about 133 acres now. And everything from the northern blocks closer to the lake, we're a little more warmer site. We get riper fruit. Uh, a little more hang time, and then we're a cooler site. There are more shale driven. We get acidity and drive in, in the, from those sites, and then and then we pick early. We pick late. We capture nuances through all the sites, and all the fruit, almost all the riesling fruit that we pick, can go into the dry riesling. So this is our priority. So for you who know us, we do years 14, 15 different rieslings. However, the dry Riesling is the priority. So this is all the fruit that we have is up for grab in order to make the dry Riesling. So, do you want to I, I, talk I, a little bit because you like? I, sh I should translate this. <laughs> so, so as, as we think about making Riesling, which has been our hallmark of our production and what really gave Herman a lot of uh, publicity early on in in his uh, in, in the winery here. Um, the, the, the dry Riesling continues to be our, our most important wine that we present. 70% percent of our production with being Riesling, we focus so much of our energy on this larger production, as Oscar mentioned, because it's the first thing we'll go to with, or it's the, the wine that people might recognize from the Finger Lakes or out of this winery. And, um, as we're picking, um, starting with the very first pickings for sparkling all the way to the very last pickings for late harvest and, and beyond. It's all with the idea that dry Riesling is, um, that those, those grapes can go into dry Riesling. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think about it in an upside down pyramid where you have the larger production up top and then you, you kind of work your way down in terms of blending and picking towards your single vineyards and then your reserve Rieslings at the bottom of your pyramid. Um, and at any point, you can pull reserve out or single vineyard juice out to go back into dry Riesling to, to make sure the dry is what it's supposed to be. So in 18, <laughs> just to clarify. That to, was no clarification. Perfect it's, clarification. Okay, yeah, right. Try to <laughs> I will, we'll get it. Sure, we'll explain it. In 2018, <laughs> being a uh, particularly challenging vintage, uh, we sacrificed a lot of single vineyards. Uh, late harvest Yosef and everything to make sure that the dry 
survives as good as it was expected to be out of a vintage that was um, was challenging. So can I can I say challenging vintage? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right, perfect. We sometimes have this debate in house when we say this is a difficult vintage, and then sometimes you have a challenging vintage. It the the wine comes out rather well, and 18 is a it was challenging, but when a winery says challenging, they might think about the, the lack of fruit they have on the vine. It might be the, the wine may have bad temper because it rains a lot and then we have to live with that. There could be a lot of things that are challenging with vintages. So when you ask a winery <laughs> challenging vintages, it might not only reflect the response. <laughs> <laughs> so, first one to so, um, but. Uh, you know, 18 was, um, 18, I think, is seared in our, our memory because it is, um, it's one of those vintages where y you had to accept losses in the vineyard um, and make really hard cuts at pressing or sorting or in the cellar to achieve whether we did a reserve, but also then a dry reason that is consistent with because had we just picked fruit and just said, well, we need volumes to it in, um, you would have seen very different wines, quality wines, um, in, in the bottle here, which would not have been acceptable. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm going to conclude. If you're trying to summarize me, I'm going to conclude. Okay, here. perfect. So, so, so <laughs> this is what we're trying to say here is a, a year like 18, we are not making single vineyards. We're not making all the other wines. And all the focus goes into this. So it kind of over delivers if you compare it to the rest of the vintage. Right. The single, yeah. yeah. So, good. I put a reserve to you. Oh, thank you. Are there any questions yet? Or can we just keep pouring and drinking here? I have a question uh, from some friends. So we're on the other side of the lake. The Swedes? Uh, Our lake. Our lake, okay. I thought like the Atlantic. Uh, Sorry about that. So the Swedes are all just saying style. School, um, okay. <laughs> Okay, okay. Hey, Mama. <laughs> uh, question from, from Red News to Heather Red News. Uh, do you cold soak uh, your reading at all? And says it is okay to say 2018 was challenging. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Do we cold soak? Red. Um, <clears throat> typically, we have not cold soaked. Um, and part of that is we're hand picking um, for the dry Riesling. We're at least 90% of the fruit going into it, and um, and then whole cluster pressing. Um, we have done um, soaks at very specific points, um, specifically to on the Auslese Yosef. We did a soak on that. That was really just actually to to bring out the botrytis in in that wine. Um, we did our first. Um, Crush and de-stem and soak on the 2019 vintage on a new vineyard that we're working on, um, one of our nursery blocks. Um, so we'll see what that, what, how that. What does is. soaking do to it? Just bring out flavor, structure. What do you, what do you for? Yeah, um, all of that. Um, you can drop your acid a little bit with okay. it. Um, you're getting flavors from the skins. Um, you're also okay. getting textures from the skins. Um, getting some bitterness. With the risk of getting some okay. phenolics, um, especially if you're planning on fermenting bone dry, you, okay. those will come out. Okay, got it. Um, because that's a pretty common thing to do. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, I know a number of really, really good Riesling producers and, and uh, oh, Riesling producers here in the Finger Lakes also, but a number of really great German producers who are doing a fair amount of cold soaking. So it's, We it's, had our intern here a couple of years ago, Konstantin Richter. Yes. They put it overnight, remember that? Yes. Everything cold yep. soaked overnight. So. Yeah, it, it's just it's actually just a stylistic decision whether to cold soak or to whole cluster press. So we classically have done whole cluster on all of our reserve rieslings and dry riesling. That was a very long for a, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but but co we could go, let's okay. I I digress. Thank we you, Heather. For the, thank you, Heather. But I should maybe talk about whole cluster later on. Then. Mm -hmm. um, we poured ourselves the reserve here. Uh, again, 18. So usually our reserve dry Riesling 
goes in similar philosophy as the dry. We look over all our vineyards. Uh, tend to be of a later pick. So uh, richer fruit, a little higher sugar levels in the fruit. So when you ferment that dry, you tend to go a little higher alcohol. And, and also kind of a little bit more drinking, to, to be quite honest, when you don't have the same pressure to make quantity, mm -hmm. uh, you make that. So some years, depending on uh, this, might, you might be in a couple hundred cases or more. This more than thousands of cases. Right. Like, so, 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 so reserve reasons us show each a little bit. Uh, and, uh, in, and again, a year like 18, we just make a small amount of it. Mm -hmm. But again, it's like, um, again, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't have to tell you that. You're going to do that anyway. Uh, but but uh, the Grosskivets in Germany mm -hmm. would be like, a, again, a little higher alcohol, a little drive in it. Mm -hmm. okay. with, with all of our wines, all the wines that we make um, are natural fermentation. So no cultured yeast at any point. We've done, done that back down from culturing. Um, and um, some of the that come in, um, it, it, well, it, it doesn't always mean that the layer picks, but some of the, the wine, the, the tanks that are going into reserve reasoning will ferment into June, July, or even August of the year. Right. Very long, slow, and typically cold fermentations, uh, especially with the, the tanks going into reserve. Um, it's hard, and, and we've, we've had to, I don't think we've necessarily changed our method um, to, to take into account these long fermentations, but to produce dry Riesling in March or, or um, May, um, sometimes we have to make hard decisions about a wine that doesn't get totally dry and say, okay, yeah. well, that is still has to go into dry Riesling. Or you um, piss off the distributor that we're out of stock. Or that's right. That's it's right. Fermenting into that's July. That's, <laughs> July. That's, <laughs> that's right. That was from the marketing <laughs> side. Uh, but but <laughs> so but also with these longer fermentation, we tend to get a little more structure, weight. Yeah. It, to it, the because and maybe if, again maybe we want to explain. Usually when you would inoculate when you would inoculate a, a, a wine, you would have a fermentation that's how many weeks. It yeah, it could be weeks. days. It could be exactly. It could be seven, eight days. It could be three weeks. With with HAW, the the older plantings here, mm -hmm. those are typically the faster ferments. Those will go um, anywhere from five to eight weeks. Magdalena is a very slow ferment, and that that comes into July or August. So um, even on the early pick fruit, um, yeah. it just just a slow fermenter. And that we is because the yeast culture in the field, because mm -hmm. what we've done, what we've done through the, year, through the years, and we've done some research together with Cornell, mm -hmm. the yeast that does ferment all these ones tend to be the field yeast Correct. that we're bringing in. Mm -hmm. So usually the speed of the fermentation has yeah. to do with uh, the culture, but also and so forth. To be scientifically correct, it's not always the yeast culture. It is the health of the must, health of okay, the, yeah, yeah. the juice itself, okay. and, and not necessarily the health. But this is the, why we have him around. This is it. It, is, it is the components of the juice that can also impact how how fast the yeast wants to yeah. ferment. But we keep these tanks cold, 58, 60 degrees throughout fermentation. Okay. Great. Cool. All right. We might have derailed a little bit there. <laughs> That's okay. All right, shall we go into next wine, another Riesling? Yeah, or you have more questions? I have a question here from Penny, uh, and this is, do you recommend aging new releases? She said they're so good she can't wait to drink them. Yeah, uh, that's, a very, that's a difficult yes to both. Can I say yeah. that now? Well, I, I, I think to be, for us, we I would, why don't you answer it? Because okay. it's... That's yeah. <laughs> um, so, to, what what we see on, especially on the single vineyards, is that between HAW and Magdalena, a, Magdalena does not taste what we blended until usually eight to ten months after, after bottling. bottling. And so, if, if as outside of the winery, 
no one really knows the bottling date. So if we bottled in August, you're looking eight to 10 months down the road where the wine tastes the way that we blended it to taste. And then after that, it's really, I, I think it's really anyone's individual choice about where our, our wines, you enjoy our wines. Uh, initially, when if you buy them in September or in, in March of, of, of that post vintage, um, you're going to get something that has a lot of um, to it and loveliness on the palate just from fermentation. And as that sits and ages over months and then years, that will subside a little bit. You're also losing some of this really um, kind of fun primary fruit to to give way to what the wine really is. And so I th I think for me, tasting our wines, I, I always look three, four years down the road right. and say, okay, that's that's what that wine is. And, and some wines will then revert back to something you're like, oh, wow, that's interesting. And then another year goes by and they come back to, wow, that is, that's exactly what our, our wine, that wine should be. So it's, it's hard to tell. Um, but I think three to four years after a vintage is a pretty good, safe bet as to this is when you could start consuming these wines. So I yeah. totally contradicted myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, but, but I think what happens when we bottle something, like in the spirit of that, if we try, mm -hmm. if you try that one, mm -hmm. I'm not going to pour for you anymore. So if you try that 19 standing stone, we got bottled and is released now. And in many wine experts said, this is, this is a young, right? Because I already got here. Oh. I'm ahead of you. Uh, uh, it tend to be, there tend to be a little bit of a bottle shock for, for, for spraces. However, you get with Riesling, you get this citrusy vibrancy, uh, freshness very early on. And within the next one, two, three years, it settles down gets a little wanted, but still have fresh fur, so it gets a little softer and, and nicer. And then maybe after the three to 10 years, then you start seeing some aging characters, mm -hmm. where, you, where the fruit drops a little bit, the fruit flavors drops, you get a little bit of those petrol flavors and so forth, depending on the vintage, of course. But, uh, but anyway, so we're not, I don't think we're answering your question. No, I think so. No. But, but I think what, one of the that. really important points is, and, and this is something that you get the information from the winery about what the vintage was. The growing season directly impacts the cycle of that wine. And, you know, warmer vintages like 16 are going to be a little showier and a little bit more upfront and powerful within that first year or three years. Whereas a, a, a more quiet vintage like 14 or 17 or even 18 um, is, will not necessarily have a longer life, but will show its true fruit, its underlying fruit, potentially later than those warmer, riper vintage. Yeah. So, you know, if you look four or five years down the road, then you've lost great fruit. Yeah, and I think that's the 18 now from when we released that, mm -hmm. it's completely different. Absolutely. And it's Absolutely delicious now. The 18 shows off, while the 19 that has fresh acidity and mm -hmm. that also show, going to show off early. Yeah. So I think that's and a good follow-up question was, what is the oldest of your Rieslings that you've ever had? <laughs> oldest of the Ries of our Rieslings? <laughs> well, we, you remember we opened the Glenora fruit? Yeah, uh, 1977. 77. That was a fruit from these vineyards, but it was not under the Weimar label. Right. And then we had... It, we, we actually tasted uh, 77 and uh, 78 Shahab, who's a, a friend of ours who lives down in Glenora Point. Um, he he, he um, took it from his grandmother's cellar, and it was a 77 and 78 under the Glenora label off a of fruit off the vineyard right out here. Yeah. Uh, and sold to Glenora, to John Williams, who was the winemaker at Glenora. Um, with that, yeah. yeah, and then, but the oldest one under the Weimar, Riesling-wise, is it 85? Uh, 80, 83 TBA. Yeah. Okay. So it's been around a while. But the best tasting ones, I think. Yeah, that wasn't this, very good. No, that wasn't very good. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but, but the best tasting one was the 85, 
uh, sparkling, sparkling riesling. riesling. Yes, we had, we had that was when was that again? When Malika was, we had it for a party. We had Herman's birthday. birthday. Herman's birthday also. In 2016. Yeah. Yes, we had a 2000 a 1985 sparkling, and it had aged beautifully. And after we have that, we actually start to make, we call it now extra brute. We do some sparkling as of 14 vintage, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 15? 15. Thank you. <laughs> All right, great, sorry. <laughs> so we've been drinking this standing stone now. You want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, if you don't have any other questions, that is. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. we would absolutely do it. Mm -hmm. Again, this is us trying this stuff out. You know, we have, uh, we're trying to figure it out, as, as I said before. And I'm sure there's a lot of questions coming our way. And now as we're getting here, we might make educational videos. We are going to, we have all kinds of plans. So, yes, stay tuned. Let's do something over at Standing Stone too. But that, in the spirit of that, that's why we brought this. <laughs> Because, um, again, we did take over another winery three years ago, 2017, mm -hmm. uh, which is a historic vineyard site on the east side of the lake, which has been known for Riesling, Chardonnay, Saparavi, and Gewürztraminer. Uh, absolutely stunning looking place. It's located on the slopes and looks over the lake. And we are now figuring out and exploring the sites and trying to make wine that we see fit that represent the sites and this is kind of maybe our first uh vintage 19 when we felt that we had full control over things mm -hmm. because 17 we took over 18 was 18. <laughs> be kind, be kind. <laughs> uh, but uh, but uh, and also that site standing stone site is a, a, again back to a rather sought after site so there's other wineries that relies on the fruit from that site and now in 19, that was a good vintage. We're now back on track with some really stellar Rieslings from, mm -hmm. from that site. And we're s super happy with it. Right. So the, the release, the 19 release here is from the northern block. Um, um, it's actually all vines from, from the Weimar Nursery. They are planted there in 2006. Um, and in, in tracking this vineyard now over three vintages, I mean, it's not a lot of information to work with, but... Um, we have um, started to pick this block a little earlier for a little bit lighter, fresher uh, Riesling and not let it hang too long. Um, and then down below this is the historic vineyard there that was planted in 1973 um, by the Gold Seal Company. Mm -hmm. And um, that wine, we're making a, basically a single vineyard dry Riesling off of that for under the Standing Stone label. Um, that's actually still fermenting. That still has quite a bit of sweetness to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, this, uh, again, this was all natural fermentation, and this is our, as a winery, this is our first release of yeah. the 19 vintage. What's nice about this site, and I think also for us, for the Finger Lakers that are listening here, we talk about warm site, cool site, and so forth. This is one of the a very, we've noticed, very protected sites. So you have the the winds and the warmth of Seneca Lake in the winter protecting mm -hmm. those vines uh, but also since the cool air are coming in from the lake in the summer it tends to also hold on to acidity quite mm -hmm. nicely so it's actually not the warmest site it's a warm in the winter but it has a little dragged out season so picking this and making so to kind of hold on to the acidity and not ferment it bone dry mm -hmm. and leave some residual is kind of where this northern block this great. I, I think Dylan talked about styling. Dylan, uh, Dylan, by the way, is our winemaker yeah. together with Fred and, and with Fred. Yeah. Sorry. So <laughs> thank you. Um, but Dylan and I have talked extensively about this vineyard site and as compared to HAW, Magdalene, and Yosef, and one, one style, of, we can pull off of HAW, but we can't pull, I don't feel like we can totally pull it off of Magdalena and Yosef because they are very ripe 
very warm mm-hmm. sites, is this really classic cabinet yeah. idea. And and so th- this is, uh, I, th- I think for us, is very exciting yeah. because w- we've styling off of a very classic Riesling. Yeah. So this comes also in a rather low, low alcohol. So, so this is a cool wine. We're happy with this. This is the first release. Uh, and yes, it's early, but it's out and delicious. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's try some short animation. Are we good? Question anything? My mother's still there? Mother is still here on Instagram. Okay. <laughs> I love it. We have an impossible question, which oh. is, what is your favorite wine they've ever made? That we've ever made? Yes. <laughs> 04 semi-dry. 04 semi-dry? Yeah. Okay. Potentially. That's not a, that's not a hard but, question. But 04 that, semi-dry is delicious. Like yeah. the 14s for, or I would almost do the 5s. Reserve dry is also delicious. Mm-hmm. Four semi dry. Mm-hmm. That's good. We can do instead of just doing one, maybe the top five. S- <laughs> sixteen, sixteen ounce laser riesling from Yosef. Oh yeah, sixteen ounce laser is good. Um, uh, Gewurztraminer from last year. Mm. Eighteen, delicious. Wow. Yeah, that was nice. Um, and uh, and the uh, H the TBA is nice. How was that? Is that a good answer? Oh nine. This was nice. Mm-hmm. That was really nice. That was compared to the <laughs> <laughs> No no no, but oh nine late harvest is delicious. Um, and also there's some surprises, you know, when you look at the thirteen vintage. Twelve twelve H A W, sorry, the drunk. <laughs> twelve H A W is mm-hmm. delicious. Uh, seven semi dry that you know, the semi... Okay, we have many answers to go through that. Chiretto from 95. No, that's <laughs> not <laughs> Yeah, so... But there's oh, Cabernet Franc. Very Cabernet Franc. Yeah. The Magdalena 16 Cabernet Franc was, mm-hmm. was very mm-hmm. nice, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we could just keep going. <laughs> Sorry, cut us off. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. No, no. We do have Okay, so... It's challenging grape. I, Pino and uh, Gewurztraminer. Pino and Gewurztraminer. Yeah, Pino and Gewurztraminer. That is based on, you know, thinner skins, tighter clusters. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so the challenge, if you want to do, look at the challenges that we have here. We have the bitter cold winters. And then we have, so you need to have vines then that survive. You need to have later budding. You need to have grape varieties that survive the winter with rain, sometimes rain and sun, the mix in between. And also a variety that enjoys, that can be picked early, but also enjoys the hang time when we have these Indian summers here. So with all that, it, it, it gets, we tend, to, we tend to pick early because there's under disease pressure, there's some botrytis there. And Pinot is a little bit up and down. So. But what else is difficult? But that, that's a, that exact question uh, is on our mind all the time. Yeah. Whether it's from a grafting or, um, I mean, we're in the process of, of pulling out vines from Magdalena, pulling out some vineyards that Herman planted in 1999, mainly because um, whether it was the wrong rootstock or the wrong plant material, but in some cases we're saying, Maybe this varietal doesn't belong on this on this site, mm-hmm. um, and maybe it belongs at Standing Stone, or maybe it belongs at HAW. Those are kind of really big picture ideas that we talk about a lot um, as we experience vineyards. Whether it's twenty years of having this vineyard in the ground in in Magdalena, and just say, well, you know, we've had Pinot, Pinot Noir here, mm-hmm. and we've really have fought with it and we've made some like the 14 Pinot Noir made some really really beautiful wines off of it but in the end are you just fighting what mother nature is trying to tell you um, and so therefore should we rip it out and put in different Pinot Noir or should we put in 
more Cabernet Franc or Blau Francish. Um, and I think as we evolve, you know, as as the, the vineyard sites and the, the Finger Lakes evolve, you'll see these varietals becoming centered in a certain area, mm-hmm. um, you know, whether that's in 10 years or 30 years, whatever. Um, so that's a, that's a question that we talk about a, a lot of, of, because you, you don't want to shy away from varietals that are difficult, because, no, right. but you also want to be honest about what you should be growing based on the site that you have. So. There are some really good Pinot producers in the area. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. our friends over at Hearts and Hands, for example, that specialize mm-hmm. on it. They are actually extremely committed to it, and they do a good job. So, mm-hmm. And then a follow-up would be, what are some uh, experimental varieties that you are mm. working on? Oh, mm. we, that's, a, that's, a, that's that, a great question. So, yeah, can I, we, you may. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you can taste the Chardonnay. I'll, I'll answer this question. For well, anyone who <laughs> might not know us, we know each other from college, so we might sound like a bickering old couple sometimes. <laughs> just how it is. <laughs> That's just how it is. So, um, varietals that we're working on, um, the, the nursery, we have a grafted grapevine nursery that Herman started in um, the late 60s here, it's great. and that um, is an avenue to produce vines for other wineries and vineyards around the country, but it's also... Um, an avenue for us to be a little experimental, um, whether it's selections of Riesling or different selections of Chardonnay, or, but it's also with varietals. So we have a site about 15 miles north called the Julia Vineyard that we've started to plant clonal selections of Cabernet Franc, Riesling. We have rootstocks planted there. And now we've ventured off and started to plant varietals that when well, we started this um, kind of 2000. 2010 um, about what other varietals belong in the Finger Lakes that aren't planted or aren't being um, even even looked at, whether it's Northern Italian, whether it's Swiss varietals, um, varietals from the Jura or the Savoie. Uh, parameters we're looking at is winter hardiness. Wi- winter hardiness was late, number one. Late budding. Later bud- budding. Yeah. And what can handle Disease pressure. Disease pressure. Rain and so forth. And then, so, varieties doesn't come in too early, and that can hang a little bit. Mm-hmm. So, and also that goes into the door. So there's that, that's one that goes in those kind of climates around the world that would yeah. reflect. So varietals that we've planted so far, um, Petit Arvin, which, is a, which yeah. is a white varietal from, from Switzerland. Switzerland. Uh, oh, hold on, hold on. Uh, Gouet Blanc or Hoenisch, which is the mother plant to Riesling. Um, on the red varietals, uh, and Ferment, Ferment white ferment varietal, is which is the, the backbone to uh, Tokai dessert wines. So oh, we've, we've actually planted a little bit something. more ferment than, than anything else. Um, on the red varietals, um, Mundu, um, Scapatino, the Grind, Zweigelt. One Road Nebbiolo, Don't Get Scared. You're uh, not doing Weber. <laughs> yeah, P- Piedmont, <laughs> Barolo, Don't Get Scared. Really, One Row, it's... And we have to have enough of it. So um, that's one of the things. And I think, to a certain extent, different selections of Blaufrankisch. Uh, Frankisch is mm-hmm. small uh, acreage in the Finger Lakes, but I, I think it really does belong Which there. we, on our labels, we call we might change. Should we change that? Uh, we need to rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. We, rock. But we, we did a, a grafting last year uh, of, of a lot of different um, Germanic varieties that are classically found in front. Um, so that planting we'll do this year. We haven't figured out exactly the vineyard site to do it on yet, though. But we also dig in deeper into different selections of recent. Yes. You know, the field, field selections and so forth, so... Looking at there's also different kinds of rieslings with different acidities and so forth. So, mm-hmm. so doing awesome. Yes. All right. Shall we? Can we? Sure. Did you yeah. So, in the spirit of challenging vintages, I think 18. Am I allowed to say it? It's better than 17, Chardonnay. You can say that. You can say that. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's 
what uh, the short that show kind of shows off uh, uh, when you are Chardonnay, of course, Chardonnay from all our vineyard sites, and it kind of shows the vintage mm -hmm. a little bit and it based on the circumstances. Sometimes mm -hmm. we flirt a little bit with oak, and sometimes we do. Very little oak. I don't have a lot of oak in this. One. No, there's very little. Yeah, it's almost so all stainless steel. Yeah, but so what happened? Little oak, so slightly unoaked. Yeah, slightly. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Say that. <laughs> I, I, what, what happened in eighteen? Early ripening varietals, like Chimera, Chardonnay, even Pinot Noir, to a certain extent, for for, like for rosé and for spring. Um, and the early picked Riesling was actually, I mean, were were really very good. Mm -hmm. It was when we got to that first week of October where you start expecting to pick Riesling um, kind of at will. I'll start selecting a little bit from here or a little bit from there. And that just didn't happen because of rain after rain after rain. The, the skins can only take so much mm -hmm. um, pounding mm -hmm. uh, before they start breaking down. That's sort of what happened in in 18, that by the time we got to middle of October, a lot of the blocks of Riesling had really just said we're, we're done. Um, and yet the really tough skin reds, Cabernet Franc, Lemberger, are, are held through that. Yeah. And we were able to get them to dry out and pick them the last week of October. Um, so go back to the styles of Chardonnay mm -hmm. that we're doing. Um, we tend to then, being in a cool climate region, you tend to not uh, get the highest of sugar levels in the grapes. So you tend to get then therefore gentler alcohol levels and therefore more delicate wines. And therefore you kind of, you dance quite lightly around the use of barrels. Hmm. Because well, it's, well said. Wasn't that yeah. uh, so, so then in this case, because of the Light vintage, mm -hmm. you don't have a lot of oak here at all. Correct. Yeah, I think it's, uh, maybe I shouldn't compare it to Burgundy, but that's a little bit what they do in Burgundy too. They don't decide on a, on a this is the oak treatment we're using in advance. While you look at a, a, a region like uh, that's consistent weather, they can actually d decide their oak and barrel treatment in advance, yeah. in a sense, mm -hmm. because they know it can. So we, we can A little bit on the Rieslings, but but I think uh, this kind of shows quite nicely. It was beautiful on the 16, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we have an argument about the 16, but anyway, yes, uh, yes, sorry, uh, question. Uh, you know, about weather and moisture, we did have a question Are you um, using the oak for Okay. Um, can I, can I yeah. answer that? Mm -hmm. So from Chardonnay, um, even Gewürztraminer, certainly uh, the red varietals, we are uh, very cautious of Botrytis, yeah. uh, always. Um, leaving Botrytis in the, in the field, um, everything that comes onto the press pad is all sorted over two tables, hand sorted. Um, so getting rid of any Botrytis um, in, in these Wines, Pinot, Pinot's sparklings, Gewürztraminer, um, Chardonnays. When it gets to the reason, we we try very very hard at beginning to middle of the season to pull out all botrytis, and that's again field selection onto the press pad because the idea is then we'll come back to that botrytis if it's in the field for either later Baronelles or Trois Baronelles uh, fruit later on. Um, or what we have started to do is with our dry Riesling, asking dry Riesling, pull Botrytis out mm -hmm. and then press that separately within a day of the uh, sort and start accumulating late harvest. Our late harvest Riesling, our bottled late harvest Riesling has 20 or 30 percent elevated Botrytis from all sortings that go into dry Riesling or the standard Riesling. So, so in general, when you enter dry, mm -hmm. you tend to have 
less or no 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 butter in yeah. the dry wines in order to again keep them a little zingier and maybe not you were a little bit about the phenolics there I, was, or, or not necessarily I mean a little bit about phenolics but the but fermentations also uh, yes a little bit of fermentations it's it's a profile it's mm-hmm. a profile change uh, from fresh undamaged fruit or fruit that has been infected with betrayal. So you start changing that profile into something that has a, maybe a little bit of creaminess or a little bit of um, bruised fruit, honey characters, which then take you, for me, take you into a different a different wine. I know some really great uh, Riesling producers who um, it doesn't matter what how much betrays they have, they're going to put that in. And you can tell that in their wine, for good or for bad, whether you like those wines. But for us, we're keeping them really tight within this sphere of clean fruit, knowing that we still have a wine, i.e. the late harvest, that we can, and, and the dessert wines, that we can use that betray. So we're not wasting fruit. That's right. I mean, that's also going, going to looking how we manage the vineyards and how we manage everything on the press bed and how we make these wines. There's a reason why some years we make 13, 14 different Riesling. It's not only to capture the styles, but also the, depending on the fruit. Mm-hmm. You have a, lack of a better word, a vehicle like Late Harvest that can actually show itself much better with some mm-hmm. botulitis fruit. Mm-hmm. So that's why you have many different styles of wine that you make. So, yeah? Um, on styles, we had a question You can answer that one. <laughs> uh, I, 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 no, no, no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. No, that's I, not right. I, I, we, we, we made, we made. Uh, hold on, we, we made ice wine in 2003, 2004, 2001. And we did it with Cabernet Franc. We did Cabernet Franc in 07. Mm-hmm. Um, and after the Cabernet Franc. Um, Cameron Franck was 08, sorry, not 07, 08. Um, after that... You said, screw it, we're not doing that again. Right. Yeah. That's basically... That's it, basically I mean, it was, it, was, um, it was just cold and everything froze and this is just me being grumpy and... That's right. And, and so annoyed. I think there's a better answer to this. No, this is... This is that, what can has I, really happened... Right? <laughs> what if I say something and then you fill in it? Okay. So... What's really happening is that if you look at so terms, like for just basic mm-hmm. stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, our our temperatures, the moisture, and so forth tend to promote botrytis. Mm-hmm. So therefore, nature here is is actually helping us to make botrytis a noble noble rot wine. Right. It's not promoting us making ice wine. While maybe you go to Canada, so if you look at Canada when they have clean fruit, non botrytis infected fruit, and then they get a cold snap, mm-hmm. that's kind of when they make their ideal ice wine. Mm-hmm. Well, here we have these long summers and then mild falls. It is kind of perfect for botrytis dessert wines. Mm-hmm. So if you just, if you become very savvy with your sorting and, and precision of picking and so forth, we can make much better Botrytis wines, then we can make ice wines. Mm-hmm. That is a much better answer. That, that, that is yeah. a good answer. I, I was actually taking this from a, a terroir standpoint. <laughs> okay. um, two, two elements. A, the human element of terroir, where the influence, the human influence is okay. very great, and I don't like being really that cold and like that annoyed about things freezing, so therefore I'm not going to make that wine. Um, versus... To your point, the terroir of what should be grown or what should be made based off yeah. of the fruit and the land that you're given. So in that regard, yes, dessert wines from Botrytis, we can do virtually every vintage. I think we've shown that throughout that in selecting, doing all hand picking on, on our main production, you leave Botrytis, which back to 18 there's no chance of coming back to whereas because the fruit just fell off the vine whereas 16 because of how long the season was you you turn around after picking your last Cabernet Franc and say wow look at all the rotten fruit still in the vineyard this is great 
and then you can make your TBAs and, and Baranels of that. Okay. So, yeah. yes. We just think we're better at doing doing the Butterfly mm -hmm. Swines than we do that. Shout out to the port at Sandy. Oh, Down yeah, that. that oh. he, he screwed that one up. <sighs> he screwed that one up. Port. Yeah, we yes. loved it. Yes. We love the port from Saparavi. The damn fruit fermented too fast this year. I, I'll, I'll oh, take full responsibility yeah. for that one. But we it, are going so, to do more of that. Yeah, that was delicious. Yeah, yeah. But it, it, we missed this. We missed a window of opportunity to fortify it while there was still residual sugar. Mm -hmm. So that's. It. I mean, Saparavi. Now we're going. Now we're going on a tangent here about other varieties. But but Standing Stone has uh, quite a lot of Saparavi, which is another variety uh, that is. A Variety, it's interior variety that carries a red variety that has a good acidity. Mm -hmm. So, have making, making fortified, fortified is, mm -hmm. is delicious. So yeah, so we, we, of I, I can say we, we we missed that. We were planning on doing it, and we yeah. had this. Can I say this? We had the spirit on hand to do it. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, but. Um, from a Friday to a Sunday afternoon, it fermented too much. Yeah. Um, so so I take full responsibility. Sorry about that. So when you for 2021, you're, you're going to need a lot of port. Yeah. So whoever asked that question, they have it. Keep it. Maybe even call us when you open it. So we can have it <laughs> because we're out. <laughs> All right. All right. Shall we? So Chardonnay, you want to say anything else? I think it's, it's great. I like it. I, I agree. I, li I like the 18 better than a little bit better than 17. Um, it, it is um, a, a lot of a lot of this fruit um, is actually is from Standing Stone. Um, mm -hmm. As we started to incorporate Standing Stone into the Weimar profile, um, and what, what we're finding is that there are certain um, portions of the Standing Stone old block that want to be in in wood, and there are certain portions to be in stainless steel. And so we're hoping to be better at making those selections, but we started this in 2018. Yeah. Um, and so this is mostly stainless steel, as we've said. Yeah. Cool. So that's, as we said, we're going to do some new releases. That's new. That's new. These are classic. And it's rosé season, Fred. It is. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Um, 19 so Was again. that social distance cheers? I, mean, <laughs> I don't know. You each. Um, I, this is again 19, you could do this, uh, we, mean again, Pinot Noir based, uh, with rosé, you pick a little early to capture the, and, and this vintage, which actually, it's funny, we, we all, so, when everyone's going to say 18 was challenging, but mine turns out well, everyone's going to just rave about it. Uh, it was a nice fruit set, even crop, good harvest, nice weather. We could capture all the fruit in its different stages and do the wines we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this is, uh, again, one of the first reads that comes at 19. Pinot picked at the right time, fresh acidity. It is just delicious and gentle alcohol. Yeah. With so. with the 19 vintage, um, we were able to do quite a bit of sparkling mm -hmm. up front with Pinot. Um, and yeah, then, just to qualify that comment, yes. our sparkling wines, either Chardonnay or Pinot in there. So yeah. most of our sparkling has Pinot. So we do grow Pinot, but most of it goes into sparkling mm -hmm. wine. So this is a... Yeah. Go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then this is 100% Pinot mm -hmm. um, for uh, for Rosé. Uh, it's the first release under the, the Weimer uh, label for 2019. Yeah. Um, and I think really in line with Rosés that we've produced over the last five yeah. or six vintages. And um, yeah, it's it's really a, a great thing. Yeah. Really, because we're Ago, Fred, we put Cap Franc. We put that's, a little more Cap Franc. It right. was a little darker rose. And, and then you started to sell Cap 
from Washington DC and then, <laughs> then you yelled at me why there was a yeah. cabaret frog. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is, I think it's a pretty common problem that finger legs producers have. Yeah. Our reds are now, now as we're getting, I think the whole region is, is growing, becoming better, we make good, good red. So we actually have this, we do with the limited amount of fruit that we have. You know, and Capron, is it like, if you don't make still wines, you have to, mm -hmm. rosé, you take away from that. Yeah. But rosé is so trendy now. So, mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is what people want for the peanut. Yes, you have a so, question. So speaking of the rosé, Crystal from Trip Hammers here on Instagram. Oh, hello, Crystal. <laughs> and she, she is, is wondering it? what method we're using to produce the rosé. So she wants to know if it's full cluster, what our skin contact is. Great question. It's actually a combination, um, a little bit of Sanye, a little bit of whole, whole cluster. Um, coming out of the it's the it's 30% that doesn't go into the cuvee, and that doesn't mean that it's any less quality, it just means it's a brut or it's uh, Blanc de Noir. There's 30% of that press load that's going to be a little softer, a little rounder. Um, that will go into the rosé. It is a block of Pinot we, we planted in 2011 that is almost exclusively for for rosé. We whole cluster all of that, mm -hmm. so hand pick whole cluster, um, and most of the color will come out of actually the spring production. Um, that harder pressed Pinot that's that's whole cluster. Uh, we have we do a little bit of of uh, crushing D stem on it. To get some color, but we we in the style that we've gravitated towards, we've started to back that down over the last few vintages. So it's mostly whole cluster in this group. And Skernik, our distributor, can tell Crystal they just got it in, so they have it. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of nice. Mm -hmm. oh, great. Your mom says thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thank God for my mother. Oh, yes. She's, oh. she's, she's so supportive. <laughs> she's supportive. <laughs> Great. All right. I don't know how much we have with time and so forth. If there's any other questions. Well, we have a difficult question which came back, which is comparing the FLX uh, terroir to uh, Mosul and Rheingau terroir and Riesling. Uh, so. Oh, my God. Back Okay. Three minutes. Okay. So Do you let me to... start. Sure. Well, we'll see. We'll okay. interrupt each other. All right. I, one thing we like to qualify is that, that Herman from me and so forth. And a lot of people say we make finger style wine, but we take a lot of effort into show off the Finger Lakes terroir. And we want to show off what grows here, how the Finger Lakes region, how the wines reflect. So it's sometimes, it's good that we should compare the, the mm -hmm. terroir, but not like, what, what is it similar to something? Uh, I think um, we obviously use techniques. You look up to some of the Austrians and German the te techniques that they use. But the importance here is to is show off Finger Lakes. Um, I think growing conditions, you're looking more into faults, maybe? Mm. Right, but now's your turn. Okay. Go. I, I think um, as, as we've compared regions and, um, and growing conditions, I, I think we look a lot more towards Rheinhessen mm. um, from an evolution standpoint where you have first, second, maximum, really in, in most cases, third generation winemakers or grape growers who are... Mm now elevating the quality, very similar to Rheinhessen. Um, we're working with a lot, lot of metals. You know, you might have Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, Riesling, and Merlot with a little bit of land on the side, all planted in the same block. Which is they have. Um, and then over will evolve towards or, or, or change over sites to things that use better. Um, but I think from also an environmental standpoint, in terms of heat, um, mm -hmm. and also then the type of acid that we get. I, I see in Why tasting- Why did I say faults then? Because faults tend to be a little riper, no? Faults is a little uh, riper. Uh, typically, it depends on 
again, where you are along the lakes. Uh, but, you know, when, when I started with Herman in 2001, our tasting notes, I remember this, like, this was like just verbatim where you had, this is a Rheingau style Riesling. This is a Mosul style late harvest. This is an Alsatian. And, you, and it didn't really like, it didn't mean anything. It was just yeah, like, it was just Herman just saying, well, you know, this is an easy way to, to relate to people. Um, we've moved so far away from that. That's right. And thank goodness, because we, we are in the Finger Lakes. So. That's right. All right. Did I answer the question? Yeah, I think I answered it. Yeah. Um, great. Yeah. Great, great. Cool. I, uh, are we up with an hour? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> This was great. This was fun. Thank you. And uh, we will follow up with, we might do this again, we might not, <laughs> but there might be more questions coming. But I think, as I said before, when we're getting a little savvier with this uh, video thing, and if people still won't come and visit us when we're on lockdown, we might do more of this. I think we're planning to do some um, uh, videos next week, maybe with the vineyard manager, who's going to do some biodynamic stuff, and uh, Dylan. The wine making team, we might talk a little bit about yeast and stuff like that. So. That's great. We'll be back. All right. Thanks, Thanks for, for coming. Uh, yeah. Bye. So Cheers, long. everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.